English is evolving. Um, but even at that, there's words in there you, you have to guess at, standing alone, to try to understand. Okay? Um, so let's go to another one. This one is the Anglo-Saxon Proto-English Manuscripts, 1995. It's the same scripture. It's the same scripture. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't recognize any of it. Let me just see if I have it here. Anglo. Uh, the story of the English falls naturally in the four periods. This is talking about the four periods that the English Bible evolved. And then um, down here, it, it talks about the language. So this is a website you can use to go back if you, if you wanted to, to go back and um, track, track some of this and see how the, um, the, the, word, the word evolved. There's some other screens I want to show you a little bit later. But, uh, but it's very, very interesting if you, if you have the time to go back and look at it. Um, but this, that was the first one. It's very...
Now, take a look at that. Where do you see verse 1, or verse 2, or verse 3, or verse 4? <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not there. Okay, because they hadn't put verses in the scriptures. Um, and I think if we had gone back further, you may not even seen some punctuation. Um, but th that's, that's how our Bible has evolved over the years. Okay? So, you don't see any, don't see any verses there. Okay, so, just, um, just to give you an idea and and matter of fact if you look at that you can hardly even understand some of that you, you, you can hardly understand a good portion of it there's another screen that I had that I wanted to show you and I don't know if it's on here I don't see it what I was looking for and I have to find that uh, but it, it, to look at an actual manuscript of the language going back years. Uh, see, this is with type, but you remember they had to handwrite it. And so it made it, the, the, even the writing, it, it, you know, it, when, when I look at how, how they put the Bible together, uh, I find it just absolutely amazing because copying the letters to make sure that you had the right letter and you didn't have a, an appendage or something going off that may make it look like another letter. Uh, so as a result, you know, yeah, there, there could be some copying errors, but the, the word itself is, is the word of God. So I just wanted to um, just show that uh, as, we, as we get started here. And, but for our lesson today, I want to start on page 36. Page 36, number three at the bottom of the page. And here, uh, we're talking about the historical accuracy of the Bible. And so, uh, number three, it says, archaeology has confirmed that writing was highly developed when Moses wrote the Pentateuch. It says, for years, skeptics doubted that Moses was capable of writing in the year 1500 B.C., but the deciphering of the famous Sinai script in 1948 showed that the Hebrews, or their Semites, had invented the first alphabet well before 1500 BC, making it possible for Moses to write the Pentateuch. And it goes on to say that in fact, the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi and other writings show that cuneiform writing had been invented by the time of Abraham, 500 years before the days of Moses. And uh, we, I tried to find more information on the Sinai script. Um, I found some, but I quite honestly didn't quite understand it all. But it was saying um, that script showed that the Hebrews and their fellow Semites had invented the first alphabet well before 1500. And many of you, when you uh, were in school, you remember hearing about Hammurabi uh, uh, and the Babylonians and their codes. Matter of fact, we remember hearing about the Egyptians. And they wrote in what? Hieroglyphics, Hieroglyphics right. So, and, and uh, you know, and how, 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 how Griffiths 
I believe um, there was progression. I'm trying to think of, there was cuneiform and then hieroglyphics and, and um, but it, the point is, is that it showed that there was writing, there was, that they were writing well before uh, the time of Moses. Let's see, so let's take a look at number four. And it says, those who have accepted the premise that the Bible is historically accurate have made some amazing discoveries. It goes on to quote, the fact that the Standard Oil Company, matter of fact, would someone read that please? Standard Oil Company decided, or excuse me, discovered oil and its operating wells and is operating wells in Egypt is generally known. But the reason for its going to that ancient land to look for oil is probably not so well known. It is asserted that one of the directors of the company happened to read the second chapter of Exodus. The third verse caught his attention. It states that the ark of bulrushes, which the mother of Moses made for her child, was daubed with slime and with pitch. This gentleman reasoned that where there was pitch, there must be oil. And if there was oil in Moses' time, it, probably, it is probably still there. So the company sent out Charles Whitshock, Whitshock its uh, geologist in Orford, to uh, make investigations with the result that oil was discovered. Mm -hmm. in that case. Okay, and they give the reference uh, for the dis discovery of oil. Um, and here's a person who um, took the Bible literally and believed what it said and went and discovered that there was indeed oil there. Uh, Figuring, figuring where there's slime, there's got to be oil. And, um, and the rest is history. As a matter of fact, there's oil all over the place over there uh, in the Middle East. But here is where the, the scriptures actually pointed it out. Yes. Hold on just a moment, Sister Sheila. Uh, there was also a mention of slime, I think, of the pebble. Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. when they uh, decided to build the tower, tower, right? Somewhere in Genesis. Uh, let's see. Two. Turn to Genesis six four. I have a reference there. Let's see. Six four or six six fourteen. I'm sorry. Six fourteen. Yeah. Make yourself oh, okay. He told him. Uh -huh. Make okay. Cover it outside with, with the pitch. pitch. Okay. But, um, Let's see. Slime. I think that's somewhere around in um, two. Turn to 1410. I have another reference there. 1410. And the veil Sidom was full of slime pits. Okay. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Sheila. You go ahead. Make your point. No, I was just saying that when they... Yeah, I think it's on. Testing. When they um, decided to build this tower, Tower of Babel, now, I thought it was in the uh, lower chapter. Around chapter 10. Let's see. Let us uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11. Mm -hmm. Come, let us. Verse 3. Mm -hmm. Mortar. And slime. Which what verse? Uh, verse 3. Yeah. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They made brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over 
the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, no, this isn't. Yeah. Your your translation says what was it? Mortar. Mortar. And mine said slime. Okay. So that's that's where you yeah, find it. Oh, it, um, maybe you said bricks or something. Um, asphalt. It says asphalt. They had bricks for stone. Mm -hmm. and they had asphalt for mortar. Okay, asphalt was your word. In King James, it says slime. Uh, slime. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so right. But again, uh, here's a person who who believed the word, and he he went where they showed that the um, where where it says they found it, and uh, he he found all, and uh, uh, you know they found all. Also, I read, uh, I don't know, maybe six months or a year ago, uh, in. In Israel, I mean, large deposits of oil. And <clears throat> I've often heard it said that one of the uh, reasons that will cause the, yeah, Russia to come down is because they're trying to take, take the oil uh, from the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we see that happening. I mean, we see it happening with Israel, with um, Syria, with, with the Russians coming down into Syria. Uh, and it's, they, I mean, they even set up their uh, navy right there in, in the sea. I'm not sure if it's the Mediterranean Sea or wherever, but uh, they set their navy up there. Okay, let's take a look at number five. Would someone read number five, please? recognized as the Dean of Palestine architecturalists or, or confirmed theology. the historical accuracy of the Bible mm -hmm. it may be stated categorically that no archaeologist discovered had ever controverted, controverted a biblical reference mm -hmm. Scores of archaeologists find have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, propel proper. Oh, proper evaluation of biblical scriptures has often led to amazing discoveries. The form less what did you say? They form. The fo oh they, they form mm -hmm. tesserang. Tesserang, small rectangular. rectangular tiles in the vast mosaic of the Bible almost incredible correct historical memory okay good and um, I didn't go back to see what uh, those archaeological findings were but um, but uh, it, it, uh, throughout history archaeology has helped to confirm many things that that were written in the scriptures and um, hmm the ark did they what do they what about the ark what did they find yeah mount ararat well they say they did and um but yes it, it was said that they, they discovered that but i'm not sure if um it, it, no i i'm you, you know it said it was discovered um, and I've seen writings that it was discovered, and yet I haven't seen actually, uh, because I would think that if it, if it was still there, that people would have been flocking to it. And uh, so, but yeah, I have I have heard that. Have you heard that, Pastor? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I I I did read it. I matter of fact, I've seen it in in tracks and and other things. That uh, if um, 
perhaps someone, if you have a chance, that's one of the things about trying to <laughs> do so many things. I, I would like to research it while I'm talking about it. But, um, but that's something that we can look up. But certainly there, there have been many, many discoveries. Matter of fact, uh, it, it, I don't know if you saw this week uh, where they fa think they found the tomb of where Christ was buried. You didn't see that? Um, yeah, they, um, yeah, well, it, it was, yeah, they knew where it was. It was, it was always at the Church of the Nativity. But, yes, the garden tomb. Um, yes, they, they reopened it, but they were, they found something else. Um, This was uh, from Yahoo, and it came out just uh, the 28th, a few days ago. And it, it talks about the original rock where Jesus Christ is traditionally believed to have been buried in Jerusalem has been exposed to the light of day for the first time in centuries. So there, there are a lot of archaeological finds being made uh, to confirm, you know, what, does, what the scriptures say. And so that's why I take with number five. Um, that he, he made a lot of discoveries. Okay, let's look at number C, the Bible, Bible's power to transform lives. Okay, now, you know, I would dare say that we don't just need the scriptures to, to prove that the scriptures has power to transform lives. I'm sure that you have testimonies yourself of how the scripture has had an impact on you and on your life, right? I, I can remember when I was uh, much younger and um, was, um, was into girls, looking at girls. And, and one of the things I read about the scriptures, it talked about, uh, you know, being married. Um, you know, before you have sexual relations with women. And boy, I said, oh, man, you can get married. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, it, 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 it had an impact. Um, you know, and, and so many other things you read. So when you, when, when you read the script, uh, it gives me hope. You know, uh, it gives me hope. You know, when you're down and, um, and it's like you don't have a, 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 a place to turn and the scripture says, um, you know, seek the Lord or pray to the Lord. Or you see where David, in times of, of struggle, he went and sought the Lord. Well, guess what? Then you go pray. You go pray, and, um, and the Lord answers prayer. Uh, 
I, I mean, but there's so many ways that, you know, I'm sure that the Lord, that, that the scripture has in, had an impact on, um, on your life where it transforms our lives. Matter of fact, it's doing so even now. You know, I, I think about the fact, he says, don't lay up treasure here on the earth where moth and rust does corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Um, I think about the other, another scripture where it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added to you. Um, I think where he talks about, um, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and you shall be saved, because there's no guarantee you're going to see tonight or see tomorrow. But you need to know the Lord before it's too late. So there's so many, there's so many different scriptures uh, where I think we can point to uh, where, the, where it talks about the, power, the Bible's power to transform lives. Anybody have a testimony where that's happened? Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, when, you know I, I just think about looking at pastors. Um, you know, when, when you're going through illness and the doctor says there's no hope, you know, and you pray anyway. And um, the Lord can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask to think. So he has the power. Uh, we know he's well able. And, uh, and we've seen it happen. Okay, let's take a look at um, some examples of uh, the Bible's power to transform lives. Did someone read number 2A about Paul? The Apostle Paul. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. First Timothy 1, 12 through 15. Amen. Did the scripture have an impact on Paul? <laughs> you bet it did. You bet it did. So much so that uh, Paul went from being a persecutor of the church to, to preaching the gospel, being persecuted for the gospel, um, writing epistles to churches that we, even that we use, and um, setting up churches. It transformed his life changed his life where he even died gave his life up for the scriptures so yes it, it definitely had an impact uh let's uh take a look someone read number two for us please uh b mm -hmm. hold, hold on just a moment sister mary John Newton, A.D. 1725 to 1807, hymn writer of Amazing Grace, ever lived as a young man, he ran away to sea with his sinful... Oh, oh I'm you sorry. missed her. I'm sorry. You missed her. Mm -hmm. John Newton of England was probably as wicked a man as has ever lived. As a young man, he ran away to sea where his sinful behavior almost cost him his life on several occasions. He was eventually sold as a slave in Africa and reduced to living on crumbs and roots he dug up under the secrecy of night. When he finally escaped, he accepted the veil of lifestyle of all with whom he came in contact. But through a missionary, God laid hold on his life. Newton accepted Jesus Christ as his savior, and later God called him to preach. 
Although John Newton was a great preacher, he is probably best remembered as a writer of him, many of which are still sung around the world. Perhaps his most famous hymn, Amazing Grace, was his personal testimony. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so me also. I'll put that in there. <laughs> Amen. 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 So you can testify to the power of the scriptures as well. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I had to go up. Do it no, I was just asking time. you the question. Pardon. That you can testify to the power of the scriptures as well. You were Truly. talking about this Truly. song, Amazing Grace. Yeah, because to me, when I open this Bible, the word of God is the book of life. Mm -hmm. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. It directs my life. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I'm going through still, I can get in it every day. Pray to the Lord, and I know that He hears my prayer. He hears, He Amen. answers. Mm -hmm. I stay in His Word because I, where else am I going to go? Mm -hmm. To no other. He's the mm -hmm. great I am. There's sure. no one else to turn to but Jesus. He is. He is. As He directs my life. Amen. Yes, He does. Read the top of the page. Um, yes, if you would, the next page. I once was lost, but now was found. <laughs> was blind, but now I see. He also wrote glorious things on these, on glorious things of thee are spoken in how sweet the name of Jesus sounds. In the church in London, of which he was the pastor, there is still an epi, is it epi epitaph. epitaph, which John Newton wrote for himself. It reads, sacred to the memory of John Newton. Once a life, Liberty. time, Liberty. Liberty. Oh, I'm sorry, once a liberator, Liberty. a libertine and bas blasphemer and slave of slaves in Africa, he renewed, but renewed, but I'm, I'm looking at the words wrong, but renewed, preferred, purified, pardoned, and appointed to preach the gospel, which he had labored to discover. Amen. Destroy. Labor to destroy. Mm -hmm. So John Newton's life was turned flipped around also. Like a hundred and eighty degrees from one to the other. For, uh, uh, from an enslaver, being enslaved to a liberator. And um, and I believe he also worked in the um, in England uh, to help free slaves for, for, for years. Um, but again, it was the power of the word, the power of the scriptures. Uh, Pastor, Pastor. Yes, yeah, uh, Pastor he was Ron. friends with um, William Wilberforce. That was, that's yeah, Wilberforce, he, Wilberforce. yes. Friends. Yes, it was Wilberforce. Yes, he, and he influenced right. uh, Wilberforce, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's who it was. Thank you, Pastor Ron. Uh, would you mind reading C? Sure. Uh, George Muller, 1805 to 1898. George Muller, as a German youth of 16, was already living a life of drunkenness, gambling, thievery, and rebellion. On one occasion, he was arrested and imprisoned for theft. At the age of 20, he was invited by a friend to a home Bible study and prayer meeting. The sight of a, of a dedicated young man there praying to a personal God gripped his heart. That night in the prophecy of his room, he cried out to God and asked, asked him to save his wretched soul. His life was dramatically changed. As a college student at the University of Hale, he observed two things that were later to change the course of his ministry. He observed the tremendous ministry of the orphanage and the lives of young people, and he met workers in that ministry whose daily, de daily needs were met by God. When God called him to work as a missionary in London and later Bristol, England, God used those impressions to motivate him to establish orphanages in Bristol and elsewhere by faith in God's provisions. Throughout the rest of his life, George Muller made it a daily practice to read and study the Bible and appropriate God's promises by faith and prayer. Although he he engaged 
and no appeals for funds and did not make his needs known publicly, Mueller was able to provide for his orphanages and for more than 2,000 orphans on the basis of taking God at his word. In addition, Mueller was able to contribute over $135,000 to other missionary and charitable causes because of his faith in a prayer answering God. His great answers to prayer and his dedication to the, to the God of the Bible have inspired other Christians to pray and trust God for their needs. Amen. Amen. And I want to just give a short testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, two days this week I was in the hospital and I wasn't sure what was going on but the Lord answered prayers and allowed me to, to come out and be back to normal. Amen. 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 How much did the word uh, uh, impact your time in the hospital? Did it have any impact at all? Oh, yeah. Um, I just, this is kind of like a side note, but um, I, I, first thing I did, I called uh, Deacon Brickhouse. I said, pray for me. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he prayed right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, also someone else, a former church member here, came there and had prayer with her. So, uh, and then I just, everyone, there were many that called and checked or text as how I was, how I was doing. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, the God, um, through his word, he influences our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you, Pastor Ron. Um, so we see um, uh, uh, the influence and, and, and what I just want to go back to something uh, under C, under George Mueller. Uh, he talked about as a German youth of 16 was already living a life of drunkenness, gambling, thievery, and rebellion. And on one occasion, he was arrested in prison for theft. At the age of 20, he was invited to a friend, to the, by a friend to a home Bible study and prayer meeting. And the sight of dedicated young men there praying for a, to a personal God gripped his life. So that was the thing, it seems like, that had an influence upon his life that uh, seeing the examples of others uh, can, make a, can make a difference in our lives as well. Now, there's um, two others, and I want to go back to this one, if you can find that. I think it's back here. I want to go back to uh, what outstanding men and women have said about the Bible. And you'll find that beginning on page 38. Let's see. Okay. Um says, what is the secret of England's superiority among the nations? Go tell your prince that this, the Bible, is the secret of England's political greatness. That was a quote from Victoria, Queen Victoria of England. Um, I didn't find a quote. I found some other quotes. But, um, uh, but when asked what the secret of England's superiority among the nations. Uh, she said, go tell your prince that the Bible is the secret of England's political greatness. Now, she had the, the testimony of saying that about the Bible. What has happened to us? If the Bible was their secret to uh, political greatness, and England, at one time, England was known as the, uh, the great power of the world. It said that the sun didn't set. There was not a place where the sun didn't set uh, uh, on the, uh, in the kingdom of England. And I, I know I didn't quote it right, but that's, that, that was what it said. Because England was such a great power. And if England was that, what has happened to us? We don't even want to accept the scriptures anymore. Uh, don't want the Ten Commandments. Uh, 
took them out of our schools, took them out of our courts. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's befuddling. But, um, but anyway, the Bible was the secret of England's political greatness. And he said uh, another quote, for uh, 40 years I have loved the word of God. I feel the blessed pages under my hand with special thank thankfulness as a rod and a staff to keep my steps firm through the valleys, uh, through the valley of shadow of depression and world calamity. Truly the Bible, the teaching of our savior is the only way out of the dark. And that was from Helen Keller. And um, Helen Keller uh, did some great things. Um, I believe she, what, yeah, yeah, and um, I had looked her up. Yeah, it was weak. This is, I meant to pull these up before I started. Well, but anyway, uh, I believe it was Helen Keller that um, f uh, worked with mosquitoes, uh, found that mosquitoes cause malaria, I think it was, or something like that. I believe that was Helen Keller. Let me, that wasn't Helen Keller? She did the Braille? Okay. I looked it up and I had them pulled up, but uh, most famous handicapped person in the world, a severe fever at age 19 months left her blind and deaf and barely able to communicate. And then it, there's more about her. Um, yeah. Okay, but anyway, Helen Keller, even blind, um, said that I have I have loved the Word of God, and and fill the blessed pages under my hand with special thankfulness, and, and you know. She wasn't the only blind person that I think about that made an outstanding contribution to the world, even being blind. Um, you know, if we look at our hymn book, um, and I'm trying to remember the person's, her name, but uh, she gave us Blessings Assurance, Fanny, Fanny Crosby, Crosby right. Uh, Blessings Assurance and so many other great, great hymns. Um, even as even as blind people, you know, being able to hear the word, and um, and the Lord touching their life and making an impact, and working in their lives. Um, so, matter of fact, I, I I have come to believe that God. Well, you know, I think about what He told Moses. Moses, you know, Moses stuttered. Uh, and, and, and Moses tried to, God wanted to use Moses to go down to Egypt to tell him, let, let his people go. And you, yes, and, and you remember the excuses Moses gave. Well, God didn't accept his excuses. And uh, God went on to use Moses uh, to, to free Israel uh, and even to lead him out of the wilderness. And, and I, I think about that because I really believe that the Lord uses people with whatever shortcomings that the rest of us don't have to show the rest of us that he's still, you know, he's still in charge and he can still use people. And, uh, you know, and one of the things I think he does is to help us to, to be humble, uh, to help us in our humility. I remember going to, to, when I was in Philadelphia in my early years, going to Bible college at the Manor Bible Institute in Philadelphia. And uh, matter of fact, Sister Brown went there when it first started to help get it going. And, and one of the things that, that happened was that there was a young man there. 
he, he, he walked hunchbacked. He had a bad limp. And there was something, I believe his face may have even been distorted. And, and, and he talked a little strange. You had to listen to him when he talked. But boy, I tell you, you listen to him give a speech or a message or a word. And it would break you down. Yes. It would break you down. Um, and um, I, I, I just remember thinking about his life. You know, he's like this. And people may want to laugh at him or make jokes or what have you. But boy, could he bring a word. He was very powerful. And um, so it just shows that the Lord can use people with uh, whatever, whatever their, their situation. Um, let's see. We want to go to the next page, page 39. And let's see. We want to look at Robert E. Lee. Okay. Would somebody read uh, read a comment about Robert E. Lee? All others are of minor importance. Has never failed to give me strength. If there's anything in my thoughts, I believe that's uh, that next one is from uh, from Daniel oh, Webster. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh huh. But um, I remember looking up about Robert E. Lee, and it talked about how he, uh, as a matter of fact, it said he didn't believe in slavery. Uh, huh? He didn't. Um, and 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 I. I you know, because I didn't know much about him, but that's that's one of the quotes I read, and uh, uh, but I forgot why he he uh, he he went to leave. For one thing, he was a Southerner, and I believe he didn't believe in government intervention or something like that. So, uh, but uh, from what I could read, he was a a, a very spiritual man. Uh, at least those were the comments. So, and here is saying that the Bible, a book. In comparison with, uh, with which, in my eyes, all others are minor, of minor importance, uh, has never failed to give me strength. And and one other thing that I found out that he was well respected man. Um, when the war was over and General Grant um, had had won the war, and I, uh, I, and, and um, Lee had to surrender. Um, Instead of taking his firearm and and um, demeaning him, uh, Grant told him, "Hey, take your firearm and you go." And he went back with honor and dignity. So that that was because he was well respected. Um, but uh, for our point here is talking about uh, these outstanding men and what they had to say about the scriptures. And so as he's um, the the Bible, a book in comparison with which, in my eyes, all others are of minor importance, has never failed to give me strength. And uh, that's something that we can take from it too, because I can tell you that, you know, it, it encourages me. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, the, the the scriptures are an encouragement, particularly when you're down. You know, we were talking about uh, David a few weeks ago. Uh, how that uh, you can get down and um, and everybody else would be down. And you remember we talked about David, how his, even his army was ready, ready to, uh, to stone him. And uh, he needed encouragement. And it says he encouraged himself. You know how he encouraged himself? In the Lord. Exactly. He said he encouraged himself in the Lord. And so, um, but in order to encourage himself in the Lord, he had to know some about the Lord. Or either have, uh, you know, read the word or what have you. And, you know, the, the, Paul said something similar. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say what? Rejoice. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. At, at Corinthians, uh, Philippians, right, 4-4. Four, four. So, you know, you just think about that. If you ain't got nothing else, you can rejoice in what the Lord has already done for you. Right? I mean, when you're down and out, I can always rejoice in the Lord. Go ahead, Pastor. Romans uh, 15, 4, Paul says, uh, for what things were written, were written for our learning, mm -hmm. that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Amen. Amen. So the word, God's word brings hope. You know, if we would, if we would read it. <laughs> there you go. And without it, obviously, we were not going to have it. Absolutely. And that's a great scripture, too. Uh, when the... Um, to, to that to that very point but you know there may come a time when hey you don't have a bible uh you don't have a scripture and uh you know the scriptures tell us to hide the word in our hearts amen so so it's important and it's important to understand him to know him and uh, we can always rejoice in the lord and encourage yourself um i haven't i you know i haven't had a situation where I've had to be in the hospital and stay in the hospital for a long period of time, like like for a night. But I, I've heard some, I, I can remember going there and some people said they, they couldn't pray. You know, they needed somebody to pray for them. And maybe it's because they were so worried or, or, you know, with things going on in their mind, what they were being told. But, um, but if we can... And again, being that I haven't been there, I'm just thinking what I would think, that I would re, just try to rejoice in what I know about the Lord. Um, but anyway, that's what I would encourage, encourage anyone about. Oh, I see our time is up. Um, certainly, um, we can, um, the, these are some uh, outstanding men and women and what they have said about the Bible but I know you have your own testimony. You have your own testimony, what you say about the scriptures. So we're going to, we're going to continue on page 40. And this talks about the, it goes to another portion talking about the canonicity of the Bible. The canonicity of the Bible. And um, I just know that the, um, the, the, the word of God is true. I know that, and um, you know when you live a life that, um, or I, I would encourage you to try to live a life where you can inspire others. Um, we we've had I don't know how many people stop by. Just just one lady was driving by. She saw the sign out there the other day, and just just said, "I I want you to pray for us." And so, um, you know. People need, people need prayer. People, need, people are looking for answers. Some are. Some think they have the answers. And they're absolutely wrong. We talk to them too. They think they got all the answers. And they're flat out wrong. But I encourage you to uh, search the word and uh, share it. Yes, Sister Mary. Then we'll close. Oh, I'm sorry. We missed Robert. Uh -huh. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 Amen. Amen. And Father God, we are we are indebted to you for your precious word. We're indebted to you for your son, indebted to you for your the spirit of the living God. And we thank you, dear Lord, for how you have worked in our lives, uh, what you have done. Um, 
for bringing us through trials and tribulations and problems. And uh, Father, we pray that we would ever look to your word um, for our help and uh, because we need you. And we live in a world today, dear Lord, where there is no hope. Uh, and without you holding everything together, there would be no hope. So, Father, we look to you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we pray that you get glory out of our lives and out of our worship today. We ask it in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.